Welcome to Staggerly's Man Cave. Let's make some micarta. So I've just gotten back from the thrift store with a nice bag full of polyester polo shirts. Check these out. Big janky logos, double XL. Starting to see a pattern here? That's right. There's a reason these all sold for 99 cents or less. Pretty much every one of them has something about them that would make them either a low demand or embarrassing to wear in public. Oh no? Don't cut up those nice shirts, you say? Well, if you think these would look good on me, you ask for it. Here to fix your cable, ma'am. <sighs> yeah, that's quite enough of that. So if you haven't turned off my video yet, I'm going to get started by cutting out all the things like seams, the collars, and of course the logos, so that I have them all rendered down to just flat pieces of fabric. Which we will later cut down to a specific size, but before doing that, we're going to get started making a mold. So here I'm just referencing a pair of commercially made knife scales that are kind of a universally averaged size, just so I can know about how big to make the chunk of micarta and how many scales I can expect to get from it. I'm also figuring in a little extra length for trimming off the far edges since they often will have a lot of imperfections. So the basic design of the mold, or rather press, we're making is composed of a bottom board fastened with screws against two sidewall pieces, and then just a removable piece that is a nice snug fit, basically the exact same dimensions as the bottom board. And the reason you should always use screws rather than nails is because you want to be able to dismantle this whole thing easily, as the excess epoxy spillage can sometimes make it difficult to extract your micarta once it's cured. Here I'm adding some little swing away latches on both sides because when the epoxy is still in its liquid state, these will help keep the top board as well as the stack of fabric from squishing and sliding out to one side. And the reason you can't just box in all four sides is because the excess epoxy actually needs a way to escape but these will help keep everything from escaping with it. As you see here, I've added another top board that's a little wider to properly support the dumbbell weights I'll be placing on top. So with the press assembly complete, I now begin cutting all my pieces of fabric to shape using the top pressing board as a reference. And I included part of this segment as an example of what not to do. So you can see here my first attempt was to simply place the board on top of the fabric then using a box cutter to cut around the edges using the board as a template. But it's not only making cuts that aren't clean, it's not time efficient at all. See, it takes me forever just to get one piece cut out. So the better way, which is what I chose to do after just one piece with the box cutter method, was to simply trace the outline with a sharpie, then cut it out with scissors. This was much quicker and made nice clean cuts. Just remember to avoid using any kind of colored marker that would be an undesirable color as they could bleed trace amounts into your micarta once the epoxy comes into contact with it. So as I continue to cut out rectangles, I want to take a moment to explain why I think polyester is a great choice for micarta over materials I've heard of some other people using. Polyester is a textile of fine woven pigmented plastic that's non-biodegradable. It's extremely tough and weather resistant. That's going to make it a much better option than something like construction paper, which I've seen some people use. Yes, the whole of micarta is saturated in epoxy resin, but in my humble opinion, I feel it's better to make one's micarta entirely out of components that are tough and durable and impervious to the elements. In addition, polyester is available in every color under the sun, which opens up all sorts of artistic options to the knife maker. This micarta, as you can see, will be alternating layers of gray and black. 30 of them to be exact, and when you're figuring thickness, on the average you will get about 1 32nd of an inch per layer of resin saturated fabric. Wow, so looks like it's time already. Yeah, this goes a lot quicker than knife making, doesn't it? Okay, so let's pour up equal amounts of part A and B of Total Boat Epoxy Resin. I don't want you to stress too much over how much to use. Generally, it's best to mix up just enough that you feel will be adequate to give each piece a nice thorough soaking. 
In this case, it was about 16 fluid ounces of each part, but at some point you're going to have to just eyeball it. One of the beauties of working with Total Boat is you're not going to run into any kind of issues as far as a lack of bonding due to whatever you're doing with it being done in two separate pours or mixings, if you will. When that's the case, this wonderful material will bond and cure as if it was all done in one single pour. So for another example of a situation you might get into, if you find you've run out of epoxy mixture but you still have a lot more layers of fabric to go, all you have to do is mix up another batch, or you could even wait until the one you've just done is cured and then mix up some more and add more layers. But that's all going to depend on how many minutes have elapsed since you mixed up your epoxy. If only about 10 minutes, for example, have gone by and you've run out of resin, well, you still have another 20 minutes at least before you need to be getting that press in place. Because I'm telling you, you've got at least 30 minutes total to work with this stuff before it starts to firm up and get warm. On the bottle, the instructions say something more like 10 minutes, but you need to remember something. Those instructions are directed at the people that are making $5,000 conference room tables and they're having to allow enough time for all the foamy little air bubbles to rise up out of their mixture. The 10 minute thing does not apply to us knife makers. Bubbles and foam do not matter to those who are squeegeeing out their layers and furthermore applying a weighted press to their project. So before you start putting down your layers into the press, you want to do as I've done here and put down some sort of paper. What I'm using here is Reynolds freezer paper, which has a slick non-stick side and usually separates from the micarta pretty easily once it's cured, unless it's stuck inside a wrinkle or something. But even if it's stuck, it all gets ground off in the end anyway. Obviously, you want to have this in place ahead of time. So as you may have noticed, I experimented with a few different ways of applying the epoxy to my layers of polyester, as I'd seen on some other YouTubers' channels. Some folks like to use a paintbrush with the fabric draped over anything that's like a washboard surface. But in the end, I found it best just to get my hands in there and just give each layer a nice soaking and then squeegee out the excess with my fingers. And then finally smooth each layer into place. Again, if I had known from the get-go that I had so much time to work with this stuff, I probably would have spent a lot more time making sure each layer was wrinkle-free. But to tell you the truth, wrinkles are not all that bad in your finished product because they start to take on a kind of swirling appearance if you have any wrinkles that looks kind of like burl. So wrinkles or no wrinkles, you really can't go wrong. Regardless, if you alternate your colors, you're going to have something that takes on the same wonderful look as laminated wood with contouring layers that mimic growth rings in natural wood grain. On that note, one word of caution I want to give you guys on your color selections that I have realized in retrospect is that whatever colors you choose, they're going to get a few shades darker once they're saturated with epoxy, kind of like how a person's hair looks darker when it's wet. For me, that didn't spell disaster, but it just made it where the layers of gray didn't contrast quite as much as I wanted with the layers of black. So the next time I go black with gray, I'm probably just going to pick out a gray shirt that's a much lighter shade. Okay, and with that last layer, I'm going to fold down the paper, apply the first board, then secure the little latches, and then place the second board, and finally place a 40-pound dumbbell on top. I didn't get it on camera, but I actually ended up moving this whole ensemble off my little flimsy table here and put a second 40 pound dumbbell on top of the first one for a total of 80 pounds of pressure. Okay, so now it's been 24 hours that I've allowed the epoxy to cure. And here I'm just removing the micarta from the press. As you can see, it does get stuck in there pretty good sometimes. And it's really nice to have the option of simply unscrewing one or both of these sidewalls for easy removal. And now I'm just using my miter saw to trim the flashing formed by the squeezed out excess epoxy from both sides. And finally, here's a brief look at how I use this micarta to make a concealed tang knife. If you're interested in seeing the full build of this knife, please check it out on my channel. It's a two-part series called Making a Buck Vanguard Inspired Golf Club Knife. As always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, it would definitely help my channel out a lot if you would subscribe. 
If you don't have a YouTube account, I just want to let you know it's really easy to make one. It only takes a few minutes. I went years without one, and I gotta say, I felt pretty silly after seeing how easy it was when I finally got around to it. You'll definitely get a lot more out of your YouTube experience by having one. Getting the opportunity to like videos, make comments, and give yourself customized playlists of your favorite videos and music. If you didn't already know it, Stagger Lee's Man Cave does have an Instagram, so please feel free to look me up over there. So thanks again, and see you next time.